Well, we've been going through uh, a series, a new series here at Voyage. We're about three weeks in. We're going through the book called First Thessalonians in the New Testament. It's on the back of your Bible. Um, and the series we've called, uh, we titled Planted in Affliction, Encouragement from a Young Church. This church, when we look at, at Paul's letter here to this church, what we're looking at, it's the church has only been around for like a few months. So they're a really young church. We are actually an older church than this church was. So it can be encouraging as we look and see like what, what this church is going through and how they're handling the situations that are thrown at them. Now, there's something kind of interesting about this letter. Now, part of it we've put right in the title, this issue of affliction. You know, a brand new church, and right when they get started, they face trouble. Right? They face real intense hardship, kind of stuff that we here in Montreal don't, don't know we don't experience. So while there's all this affliction in the background, at the same time, of all the letters of the New Testament, this is one of the most joyful, encouraging letters. How do these two things go hand in hand, right? In our, in our wisdom of the world here, you know, our sense of joy or peace or happiness is intimately connected to the circumstances that we're in. And yet these seem to conflict then in our minds. How can we have joy in the midst of affliction? So we're going to see that really come to a head in our passage today as we bring these two things together side by side. But before we kind of get into that, I think kind of the, the secret sauce that we need to focus on is going to have us reflect on the issue of being disconnected or disconnection, if you will. <clears throat> and um, I'm going to apologize to anyone who's like younger than me. Um, because you probably hate hearing people harp about this, right? That as individuals, we're more disconnected from one another than at any point really in our society's history. Right? That issue of us being a disconnected generation, even though we're so connected, overconnected digitally uh, through social media and, and just through, through our, like, you know, our devices, we are growing apart in real life from one another. You probably hate hearing that complaint over and over again. And so much was like, yes, we know, we know already. We get on with it. We're, we're sick of hearing that over and over again, right? The reason that we harp on it so much is because of the consequences. And as a society, we really haven't tasted, I think, really what the consequences of that are like. So I'm going to travel back in time a little bit just to get, get us thinking about why is it such a big deal? Why is it such a big deal that we are disconnected? And maybe you're beginning to sense this too in your own life. Um, I'm sure at some point in, I don't know how it is in Quebec when you learn, how you learn history in, in grade school, but at some point you probably heard of the Industrial Revolution in England. Right, we get some nods a little bit, or is it like, no idea. Some of you guys know, okay, we're getting some thumbs, okay. The Industrial Revolution in England. This was a period of time where there was great social upheaval, right? Great social upheaval, a lot of different things going on at the same time. And these factors came together to create something very unique. So on one hand, most people in that time in England basically lived on farms, little rural communities dotted all over the English countryside. And a lot of these people mostly were renting their farm. And so you imagine the entire household, you know, mom, dad, the kids, they're all kind of living together in the same little shack, farm in the same land, working all in the same house. And they've got other little families kind of nearby in a little village. And it creates this kind of like self, self-sustaining kind of community. But all of a sudden, uh, around the time of the Industrial Revolution, land laws were changing. And what happened was a lot of those farmers who were renting their land were driven out, were kicked out of the land that they were renting. And so now homeless and jobless, they had to go to the cities. But at the same time, there was technological advances, so there were new factories being built, right? Change the means of production. We can now build mass amounts of goods. So these homeless, jobless farmers who are all getting kicked out of the countryside en masse, end up in these big cities and living in kind of slums. And they got jobs in factories. Now, it gets even worse, because factory life and factory jobs in the Industrial Revolution kind of looked like this. Dad goes to his factory job for like eight to 12 hours a day. Mom takes her kids to her factory job eight to 12 hours a day, and kids have their own jobs at that factory. So you can see that automatically we've got this new system where people are disconnected from the communities that they've grown up in and relied on. Generations are being split apart. Not only that, even when a family would to move and relocate because they need to you know, feed themselves, they need to work, 
Their jobs have meant that they themselves don't really spend much waking time with one another. The family disintegrates. If you know anything about, like, the, you read any fiction like Charles Dickens or anything, they get this picture, this window through art about what is life in the Industrial Revolution, and the features that come out are squalor, rampant crime, alcoholism, drug abuse, mass misery for countless untold number of people. One really mind-boggling statistic is that London during the Industrial Revolution was the capital, by far and away the capital of prostitution in all of Europe. Because you know what happens, and we can all relate to the fact that we all have bad days. We all suffer, we all go through struggle and hardship. Being disconnected is a hardship in and of itself. But what makes matters worse is when difficult times come to us and we're alone. It's so much easier, right, when you're struggling to be able to turn to a friend or a, fa or a family member. But when we're disconnected from the communities that we've relied on, when we're disconnected from other people, to be able to say, hey, this is who I am. Help me. We can't do that. Now we're vulnerable. Maybe you've experienced this, going through hardship and feeling, I can't talk to anybody about this. But the pain is so great, it needs to go away. And what do we do? We reach to the easiest thing, the quickest thing that's going to take away our pain, either numb our pain or distract us. And we know that the things that numb our pain or distract our pain are what? Always bad for us, aren't they? They always cause some sort of other damage in our hearts or to our bodies or our minds. And it creates a cycle of dependency that keeps us going back to things that harm us in the end. And we see we get into this, now this cycle. And we struggle. And the pain just keeps reverberating over and over again. This is what happens when we struggle with being disconnected. Those hardships will come. You know, the bigger clue on all this, though, is that God did not design us that way. If you think about it, very plainly and very obviously throughout Scripture, God says, you are not meant to be alone. You are not meant to be disconnected. I designed you for community. Right? If you go back to the, the story of creation in Genesis, God's creating everything, and he keeps saying, this is good, this is good, this is good. He creates Adam. This is very good. And then he goes, wait, Adam's alone. This is not good. It's the first not good in the Bible, right after creation. is Adam's alone. Not good. God says that. Not alone. Yeah, alone, not good. And if you even think of biblical wisdom, right? There are certain books of scripture that are considered wisdom books. If you just read for a minute from uh, the wisdom book called Ecclesiastes in chapter 4. Solomon, like the wisest king of Israel, right? The wisest man of his time. He says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls... His companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can a person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Over and over again, God keeps telling us, hey, you need to be connected with other people. That's how I made you. That's how I work in your life, through one another. Don't be alone. As we come to this, now this letter here in 1 Thessalonians, we're going to see, we're going to see some pretty awesome connection. So let's turn there, if you will, with me. It's a little bit, it's a bit more than maybe usual to read today, but it's worth it. So let's go through this together. Starting in, in chapter 2, verse 13. <clears throat> so Paul writing here again, um, writing in, in, in somewhat of a long introduction. This is why we constantly thank God, because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as a human message, but as it truly is, the word of God, which also works effectively in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, since you have also suffered the same things uh, from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone by keeping us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. But as a result, they are constantly filling up their sins to the limit, and wrath has overtaken them at last. 
But as for us, brothers and sisters, after we were forced to leave you for a short time, in person, not in heart, we greatly desired and made every effort to return and see you face to face. So we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could no longer stand it, we thought it was better to be left alone in Athens, and we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you concerning your faith, so that no one will be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourself know that we are appointed to this. In fact, when we were with you, we told you in advance that we were going to experience affliction, and as you know, it happened. For this reason, when I could no longer stand it, I also sent him to find out about your faith, fearing that the tempter had tempted you and that our labor might be for nothing. But now Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news about your faith and love. He reported that you always have good memories of us and that you long to see us as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and affliction, we were encouraged about you through your faith. For now we live if you stand firm in the Lord. How can we thank God for you in return for all the joy we experience before our God because of you as we pray very earnestly night and day to see you face to face and to complete what is lacking in your faith? Well, I know there's a lot there, but if you just take, take the whole picture, I, I think it's just incredible and amazing. You know, I, so Paul and, and the ministry team, they had to leave Thessalonica early, and they're just worried about what's going back to this church of these young believers. Finally, they're able to send Timothy back there, and he returns with his great news. And that's what, that's what spurs on this letter from Paul. And if you noticed, as we were reading through, it's almost like, kind of like this, if you just think it visually, it's like affliction, joy, affliction, joy, right? One thing after another. It's something negative, but, but the great joy. Something negative, but great encouragement. Right? These two kind of poles that for us are just so opposite. Right? Affliction and hardship and suffering, but joy and encouragement. We think they're worlds apart, but right here in this letter, they go hand in hand. So let's break down these two parts that we see going on here. Affliction and joy. Let's start with affliction because we probably want to end on a high note, right? So we should probably just end with joy. But also I think if we're going to really understand, understand the joy here, we need to really grasp the affliction then it'll kind of make the joy seem more realistic to what, what it really is. And we've talked about affliction in the past, the past couple of weeks, so I just want to go through it very briefly, right? Always keep it in the background of the Thessalonian church. They started uh, automatically with, with hardship. They started automatically with hardship. There was political affliction against the church, right? The local leaders of, of uh, Thessalonica, like the mayor and the municipal leaders, as we would understand them today, they felt that the church was a threat to their power. So they automatically were arresting people who, who were leading the church. There's also a social uh, affliction that this church would face because now becoming believers, becoming Christians and following Jesus, they can no longer go to like all the different pagan ceremonies that really make up normal everyday life in the Roman Empire. So now they're ostracizing themselves really and as a, as a consequence, losing probably some family, losing friends, losing social connections, losing perhaps their jobs, right? So it's a serious, serious decision with very real consequences that they're facing. This is the affliction that's coming on this church. And Paul describes it as mirroring what the church of Judea once experienced. And if you go and if you ever read through the book of Acts, which I really encourage you to do, it's a great little history of the early church, we see that the persecution of the church in Jerusalem, which was the first church ever planted by the apostles, was so bad that pretty much most of the church had to just leave the city because people were getting stoned and killed and arrested. So Paul is even saying, look, the affliction that you're going through, it's just like what we see back in Judea. Like it just shows even more so that your faith is genuine. You're going through the exact same trials that your brothers and sisters have in other parts of the world. There's also an affliction, though, for the church ministry, uh, ministry team, like the church planters, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, these guys who are going from city to city, ministering, uh, planting churches, preaching the gospel. He doesn't even mention it in the passage, but just to give us an idea, like he doesn't even mention it when he talks about his affliction, but his job is affliction. 
All right, like when he goes from town to town, he is guaranteed to be rejected. In every city he goes to, there's always like a rejection against him and his message. And it usually is some kind of like reputation smear, uh, a verbal attack. And I, I just think for any one of us to imagine going into a new city to go announce a message, and every time you do that, people hate you and mock you and insult you for it. And that's your job. You go from town to town to town to do just that. Doesn't end there. Also, like, I wouldn't say all the time, but a lot of times, almost 50% in a lot of the places we can imagine, he's additionally beaten, whipped, stoned, thrown in jail, there's riots, he faces lots of physical violence for his message. So every time he goes into town, it's like, this is, chances are, what we're going to expect to see. And not only that, you think he'd get a break between going from city to city, but traveling by foot down the, down the road between cities in, in the Roman Empire was dangerous business. There's zero protection against any bandits, robbers, or wild animals, all of which would want to kill your life. So that's his job. That's his job. He doesn't mention that as one of the things that are afflicting him right now, this really job that no one would probably want to take. No, he's talking about different kinds of affliction that are really bothering him right now. The first one is even unmentioned. There's some sort of logistic hindrance going on with him. As he's struggling to try and get back to Thessalonica, to try and see the, this church, he goes so far to say that Satan is actually hindering him. There is spiritual affliction that is happening behind the scenes, and we don't maybe see this in our own lives. You know, our Western scientific worldviews, we tend to just stick with things that we can touch and feel or, or read and kind of assess scientifically. We're spiritual beings, but we don't really... We don't really understand spiritual things very well. And when he's looking at all the logistic issues that are, that are struggling, whatever, it's money or resources or something, they can't go back to see this church and help them out. He's saying Satan is behind this. There are spiritual forces at work that are opposing us and what we do. Can you imagine waking up every morning and just reminding yourself that there's a spiritual force against me? That's really a hard thing to get in your... To, you know, it's a hard thing if you think of the weight of that on your, on your chest, on your shoulders. There's a spiritual affliction that is raging against Paul and his team and holding them back that they have to fight against. That's one kind of affliction they're facing. The other one is an emotional affliction. Grief. Worry. They're burdened by it. Twice he says, right? Twice he says, when we could no longer bear it, we sent back Timothy when we were able to. Timothy, all by himself, the young men, go on your own. We can't bear it anymore, not knowing what's going on with our brothers and sisters in this church. And then he goes and says, even I, just me, Paul, I was burdened by worry and grief when I could no longer stand it. I sent the boy alone to go and see if you guys were okay. Think of the anxiety that's building up in this guy. Paul, he's worried. My brothers and sisters, these people that I, I, I taught them the gospel, I brought them to faith, and I had to leave them before I could finish my work. They're in an ugly spot. What's going on with them? He doesn't know. That worry and grief is like seeping through his bones. This painful affliction that he's going through. <clears throat> then we see that news of what's going on, news of their faith, that's all he needs. And no longer anything that he's gone through is diminished or affects him. Joy truly defeats the effect of the affliction. So, in verse 7 and 9, I want to read that again, just to, just to see the level of joy. And remember, there is affliction in this man's life that we don't even see in this passage. This guy's day-to-day -day job is filled with hardship. Verses 7 and 9. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and affliction... We were encouraged about you through your faith. In all of our distress, all of our affliction, we are encouraged when we got news of your story. Just news about what's going on in Thessalonica, what's going on in your hearts, seeing God at work in your lives, in everything that we're going through, man, we are encouraged. That's what he's saying. He goes so far, for now we live if you stand firm in the Lord. It's like, we got news that you guys are faithful, that you guys, that God is in your midst, that God is working in your church. Man, now I'm alive. Before, when I didn't know, it's like I was dead. We are alive now that we know that you are alive in God. The power of that statement. How can we thank God for you 
in return for all the joy that we experience before our God because of you. All the encouragement and the joy that he hears from them. You imagine that. And everything that he's going through and experiencing, from city to city, the travels, the hardship, the pain and the weariness of not knowing what's going on in this church, the anxiety that's been built up in this man's body, knowing that spiritual forces are at work against him. Satan himself is waging war against Paul. And he says, wow, I know that you guys are faithful, that God is working in your church. I am encouraged. I am filled with joy. All my afflictions are nothing now that I know what is going on in your life. And it doesn't just end there. Because Timothy reports something very similar from the other angle. In verse 6, Timothy has come, okay, Timothy has come and brought us good news about your faith and love. He reported that you always have good memories of us and that you long to see us as we long to see you. See, there's that question mark in this relationship that's answered here. Paul and the team, they had to leave like in the, in the cover of darkness, before they could finish the work, before they could finish setting the foundation of the church. And we'll see later on in the weeks ahead that there's still questions that this church, that these people are asking because they didn't get to really understand the fullness of all the teachings. And it was in the midst of a riot that people were being arrested and they had to, to leave out qu quietly and quickly. So there's this question mark. It's like, what do the, the people in Thessalonica think of us? Like, do they... Un do they still hold us in, in regard as their teachers, as, the, as their spiritual parents, as brothers and sisters? Are they angry? Are they upset? Do they have some sort of grudge? Are they, are they able to forgive us? Like, what is going on? In the midst of the hardship that the church in Thessalonica are facing, in the midst of their persecution that they're suffering, again, brand new believers. They've all come to faith within the past few months. What is it? They always have good memories, and they long to see us. Always have good memories. Can you imagine someone comes into town, brings you the, the good news of the gospel, and you're like, okay, this sounds awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to do this. I'm going to give my life. And then all of a sudden, the hardship starts popping up left, right, and center. Man, the, the guys who run this town hate me. They want to throw me in jail. My people are rejecting me left, right, and center. And they're encouraged. They're going strong. They're fighting. They're staying faithful. And they're kept alive by these good memories of these guys who came in and taught me that and good, they gave me that good news from the beginning. I want to see them again. There is love here. There is love. There is appreciation. There is a depth of a relationship that even when the ministry team is gone, remember, they would have only spent probably like a couple of months with each other. Brand new strangers, a couple of months. They've left, and the memories of, the, of those connections, the memories of that relationship are keeping them strong in the midst of their affliction. Despite what they've gone through, they have kept good memories. It's amazing. And they're able to keep this, this relationship. If you think about it, it was, it was a powerful relationship that was forged. Paul comes together, Paul, Timothy, and Silas, the team comes in, and they bring a church together. They formed a church. They created a community that did not exist. The people that they were bringing, bringing in were strangers to them. And we saw last week how they, they basically sacrificed their lives. They worked day in, day out, making tents with their hands while preaching and teaching the gospel at the same time. And vice versa, that the, the people of Thessalonica who, who welcomed them, let them stay in their homes, fed them, took care of them. They've suffered for one another. And it's such a brief period of time, too. It's incredible how formerly strangers all of a sudden come together. <clears throat> but it's this joy, this encouragement that we see that comes through this relationship between these different brothers and sisters in Christ I'm going to argue and tell you that it's essential. This is how the church should be. I know it's not what everyone experiences. I know I've had a lot of negative experiences with people in church, a lot of bad relationships. 
But this is what church is supposed to be. This is how the church is supposed to, what, how it was designed, what it was designed for. Our sin can often get in the way, and it does. Paul doesn't always have great relationships with everybody in every church, and plenty of his letters will attest to that. But there is a deeper love and joy of relationship that should always be present. And the reason that is so is because the affliction that they face is also an essential feature of Christian life. If you're here today and you're not a believer, maybe you're just kind of curious, coming to getting to know who Jesus is, getting to know what the church is about or what Christianity is about, I don't mean to scare you off by saying that affliction is like the standard for the Christian life. But I mean, if we're honest, affliction is just standard for human life, right? Everybody suffers. Everyone faces some kind of hardship, whether it's physical, emotional, economical, whatever it is. We all at some point find ourselves face down in the mud and hating on life. Now there's something that was especially, I'd say unique about Christian suffering. So while you may suffer in this world as a, as a non-believer or as a believer, that's all the same, but how you suffer is different, or what you suffer for is different. Right? God designed us, designed all of humanity with a, desi- with a purpose, special design and purpose that God has given us. Now the rest of the world, all of the world, runs contrary to that design. We see it most, I think, especially in Jesus. To follow God faithfully, to follow his design, means we go against the grain. And you know there's always a problem when you go against the grain. You always face pushback. You always face some cost when you go against the grain. And Jesus is that prime example, right? He came to earth, God in human flesh, and he lived a life perfect, perfectly aligned to God's design for humanity. And what happened in Jesus' life? Did he get lots of friends, make lots of money, get a lot of success? The one thing he made was a heck of a lot of enemies. Pretty much everyone of the elite, everyone who had power, save like two guys in all of Jerusalem and Judea, and, and they all hated him. They all hated him. And even most of the masses that were following around wanting to see miracles, at the end of the day, turned on him. Jesus' legacy was a whole heap of people behind him looking to get him killed, and eventually he did. And Jesus, uh, at that last supper before he was executed, if you go to John's Gospel in chapter 15, verse 20, he he, he says to, he, he basically tells the disciples, he says, look, the slave is not greater than his master. You know, what I got, you should expect. Basically, he says, you know, if they've persecuted me, well, they're gonna persecute you. If you follow me, you're going to get the same kind of treatment, right? If I come and I'm doing all this, I'm living perfectly to God's design, and I'm just getting enemies, well, guys, you come and try and imitate me in this world, you're going to get those exact same enemies. You're going to walk walk in my footsteps. You're going to go against the grain of the world. You're going to face the same response that I did. It's expected. Like, Like Paul says, Satan is hindering me. There are forces of darkness and there are forces of the world, both of them opposed to God. Both of them opposed to God. And when you follow God, you face, you face the pushback. You face the hardship. You face the adversity. This is typical. This is to be expected in the Christian walk. But then we come in and we see this joy. We get this joy from the relationship that God gives us. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he died for our sin. In other words, he died for all the ways in which we disobey God. All the ways in which we live contrary to that design and purpose that God wanted us to follow. In a sense, because we've ditched God's plans for our own, we owe God. Right? It's like we owe a debt to God. We've disobeyed him. Right? Hey, buddy, you want to get up here and preach too? <laughs> That's cute, though. That's cute. Um, No. We owe a debt to God because of that. Instead of paying it ourselves, Jesus dies in order to pay our debt, to pay our penalty. If we have faith and trust in Jesus, in his death, God says, you know what? I I will reckon your debt paid. I will see that Jesus has paid in your place. And if you don't owe me anymore, God says, our relationship changes. It's no longer creditor to debtor. 
No, now the relationship with God is one of love, one of acceptance, one of an embrace. It is a love so profound and deep that God has for us when we come to him in faith that he calls us children. You recognize that he calls us children. He says, you are my son, you are my daughter. Now that you see there's a family dynamic going on. Crazy. We went from owing God a debt. We've disobeyed him. Jesus dies for us. Now we're, we're in like this family with God. He calls us children. But family also has what? It has siblings. It has siblings. And we look around, there's other people that are in that same position. Their relationship with God has changed. And what the Bible also tells us is that God, even though he's everywhere, he's omnipresent, his Holy Spirit is especially near and close to those who have faith in him, to those whom he loves as children. The Bible goes so far as to say that even that he dwells within us is the language that he uses. The Spirit is always with us. So we have this link, actually, of the Holy Spirit connecting us, brothers and sisters, right? Now we see that we're all intertwined and we're connected. There is a relationship that is forged through the Spirit that is, it is thicker than blood. Thicker than blood. The hope, the love, the joy, the acceptance, the embrace, the sacrifice, the forgiveness, all of these things that God gives to us, the, the things that qualify and qu the relationship we have with God is now meant for one another within the family of God. And another word for the family of God is the body of Christ. Another word for that is the church. This is what the church is supposed to be. This is what the church is designed for. Now does it start to make sense a little bit why Paul rolls into some city in Macedonia? He's a Jew from the, the other side of the Mediterranean almost. He rolls in, and within a few months, he's got a community of people who, even through being arrested and being kicked out, like their lives torn to pieces, they look back at this guy they've known for a few months, and it's fond memories. I want to see this guy again. Man, when I'm going through such hardship, I remember that guy, Paul, and I'm encouraged. And he's going through and walking through cities, facing all kinds of danger, and he's worried. And when he hears good news of these people who are like a few months ago strangers, he's like, they're faithful to God. Man, I'm so happy. Man, I'm filled with joy. I'm encouraged. Satan is against me, but hey, I'm having a great day because my brothers who I knew for a few months ago are faithful to God. The one thing that matters most, their souls, their salvation, their relationship with the Lord, that's the one thing I care about. Man. It's wonderful. I'm lifted to the skies. All I want to do is go to God and thank him for you. There are people in this church. <clears throat> it's funny. You know, I'll give a little story out of it. Fanny's not here. I'll talk about her. She's missing today. Um, <clears throat> but it was funny because this week she was over at our house just for, for dinner with, with my wife. And we're sitting on the couch and we're talking. And I swear I was talking about people who used to be, uh, help us plant this church like over a year ago. And I was like talking to her as if she knew these people. She had no clue. Well, she, she'd heard about their names, but she didn't remember anything about them. She never met any of them. And then we realized, wait, you only started coming to Voyage like in August. I know maybe it's not crazy for some of you guys here, but I was like, I thought I knew this person for a year and a half. I've known her for like less than six months. And here I thought she's sitting across from me in the living room. I'm like, I've known you for a year and a half. I, I, would, I would swear, like, you know, this is, this is the truth. No, not at all. And that's pretty much for everyone here. Like, we do not know each other for very long, but it feels like ages, doesn't it? And it blew me away. I'm thinking, I was thinking this week how, like, man, there are people that I know that I've known for years, years and years, people I've grown up with, some people I'm, I'm related to. By blood, you know? But there are people in this room who I've known for months who I open my, I can share things with that I can't share with some of these other people. There are people that I've known for months that I can, I can open up my heart and say, hey, this is who I am. I'm struggling right now. And I trust that person. How is a relationship like that even possible? How is that even real? But it is through the power of God. Because God is alive in us and connecting us to one another. This is what the church is supposed to be about, right? Think about it. You can have your online community. We're all looking for something bigger than ourselves to belong to, right? And bam, you just find that, like, that little group on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and you can put out a few things, get a, get, a, get a reputation by posting a lot or something or interacting a lot. But as soon as your battery power dies, poof, it's gone. And I mean, honestly, how much did you really open up with, with who you are? How much did you really share your joys and your struggles, both of them? 
How many of those people in those groups and those communities that you're a part of, how many of them can look at you and know the depth of your heart? How many times do you look at those people and say, that person knows who I really am inside? That's hard for us to do. The only arena where we can do that is here, where you can open up and say, and this is kind of my, this is what I, what I hope to see here, and this is our vision as a church, right? We were talking about it last month, having a community, community in Christ. That when we're struggling, we can go to one another. Maybe we're embarrassed about it because, you know what, chances are some of our struggles because we've done something stupid. We've done something cruel or bad, and now we're facing the consequences. We can go around to one another and say, look, I, I've done this and it's wrong, and I'm suffering for it. It makes us look a certain way that we're not comfortable with. But you know what, that brother or sister you talk to, they're going through the exact same thing. They've come to, come, to, come to the cross of Christ. They've come to know who Jesus is, and they know that they fall short too, that they've screwed up big time. And that Jesus died for that, knowing who we were at our worst. So we can look at one another and say, you know, hey, I know your ugly side. And Jesus died for that. Who am I to do anything but accept you? We can open our hearts really to one another where it really hurts. And you know what? When we're the ones hurting, we can look and, and share and talk and one of the things that's really wonderful that we see right here in this passage, imagine you're really struggling. Maybe you're having a hard time hearing from God. You can look over at your brother and sister, and they can share. Right? We share the hardships, but we share the good stuff, too. We share the blessings. We share the joy. We share how God is moving in our lives. And maybe I'm struggling to hear from God, and I look over at my brother, and he tells me some, something awesome, something about how God, even if it's small, God is working in my life. God is showing me this about myself. I was struggling, God has lifted me up. God has taught me something new, something that I didn't even know. Now I'm growing in faith. And I can be like, wow, man, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. My brother is showing me the work of God in his life. My sister is showing me that while it's dark here, where I can't hear anything, but God is alive right here. So I know I have faith because I know who God is, because he has called me his own. I know that it's just a matter of time that I'm going to be right there that that's going to be me. That in all the affliction that I face, man, God is alive and he loves me and he's surrounded me by people where I can see him alive and it gives me hope. Because God ministers to us through his Holy Spirit, through one another. And that's how we come together as a community, lifting one another up in the midst of our affliction. Our challenge for this week one thing I don't want to be missed here, because it sounds like we just kind of have to sit back and soak it all in, and that's not the case. There is a struggle going on here. There's a fight going on here that we need to be engaged in. Paul doesn't sit back and just kind of complain, right? Satan's hindering me. I can't get back to this church. I'm really worried. What does he do? He's fighting. He's trying to keep the relationship alive. He's struggling. I can't get back to the city. I can't get back to this church to check up on them. I'm being hindered. Does he give up? No, he keeps fighting. Finally, fine. We'll send, send the boy back. At least he can go on his own. We're going to keep this relationship alive. We're going to fight for these people. We're going to be there. Some way, somehow, it's going to happen. The people in Thessalonica, they're keeping the memories alive. They're going back and remembering what they've tasted, seen, and heard. When, when Paul and the ministry team was among them, bringing them the gospel the first time, in the midst of their affliction, they're keeping it alive. They're stoking the fire. What are we doing? Are we fighting for our relationships? I know some of you guys have made brand new relationships here in this church, and they're phenomenal and they're wonderful. It's time to keep fighting. Don't rest on our laurels, right? So our challenge for, for two challenges for our week here. I want you to think and pray over a relationship within Voyage that you haven't really developed yet. Think of somebody. Now, it might be kind of embarrassing, you know, to send a text now, and it's like, okay, that person texted me because, you know, Cody Sermon said to text somebody and, and strike up a relationship. Look, we're all in the same boat. You come in, you gravitate to someone who has something similar, that's fine, but we're all, it's been a few months for most of us here, okay? So there's no shame. Pray over and think about one person you don't have, maybe a very deep relationship with. You know them a bit here and there, but you haven't gone deep with them yet. Pray over that and build that relationship. Get to know them. Take them out for, I don't know, coffee or something within the church. Reach out to someone new. Second thing, we're an outward-facing community. 
right? We're not, a, we're not a closed little gated community here. It's not a holy huddle. We're invitational. We look outwards. That's our prime stance as a circle and everyone's facing outside. You know people in your life who don't know the gospel, who don't know Jesus. Find those people. Strike up. A, if it's a new relationship, go for it. Someone you don't know, invite them over. Talk to them. Get to know them. If it's someone you've already known, develop that relationship further. Just open up and be vulnerable with what you're going through and show how, show how God has been transforming your life. And invite them into this community, this community of faith, where God will make all things new. Let's bow our heads and close with prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much that you do not leave us alone. I just think, may we just think back and reflect on even how Jesus, when you left, you left behind two things. When you died, you left behind two things. A group of, a group of men and women who could support one another. You, you left behind a community of followers that has only grown and grown ever since. But this little community was left behind to support one another. And you left behind the great counselor, your Holy Spirit, to fill them up and connect them to one another. May we continue to walk in that image and in that, in that pattern. When we look at one another, may we really truly see it goes beyond brother and sister as we see in blood. But may we see someone that you died for and realize the kindred close connection that we have as you work in their lives and in our lives. And we would feel and sense that calling towards one another to lay down our lives and serve one another, to love and hope in one another. And may we be encouraged by seeing you walk in our midst through the lives of everyone here. May you build us in this way. May you just light the way forward that we be faithful to this calling. In all things, we praise you. Amen.